Welcome to the seventh webinar in Utiligence series on the new normal with COVID-19. This actually marks the third webinar in the series that is dedicated to managing extraordinary change from the different vantage points of the utility organization. Now today, we're going to explore the considerations for an at-home work environment, as well as for those looking to return to normal or the pre-COVID state of recalling remote workers back into the office. My name is Penny Tootle, and I'll be sharing insights from successful practices that might inform utility considerations for developing, supporting, recalling, and possibly re-envisioning at-home workers. As the Director of Customer Engagement with Utiligent, I'm intently focused on helping organizations develop solid frameworks for managing the changes they are facing, especially in times like these. Today's webinar will focus on the remote workforce in three ways beginning with the risk value proposition. I will then share insightful points to consider when enabling a remote frontline, as well as where some may be making decisions today around whether to recall remote workers to a centralized office or not. Of course, I'll wrap up with a few concluding thoughts. So let's get started. Utility employees are critical to the stability of the communities they serve. As populations around the globe respond to the COVID-19 pandemic by sheltering in place, Utility providers are rapidly adapting to maintain critical services by adopting innovation and work structures that are not typically associated with the industry. Perhaps the most significant adjustment has been the willingness to incorporate remote work into a responsiveness strategy. For those who have, the question now is, for how long? Utiligent, as an organization, is dedicated to bringing innovation to a thriving utility sector, and we hope that the information that is provided throughout this webinar is helpful to those efforts. To that end, there might be those that are still contemplating the value proposition for instituting a remote utility workforce, uh, especially at the front line. Consider the proposition of going to this new structure based on what you might gain before dismantling the notion uh, in considering what might be at risk. Remember to ask the risk question against the backdrop of the former status quo. When contemplating the implications of a remote front line, uh, some of the things you might want to contemplate is how back office operations might now contribute to the organization's environmental goals. Things such as reduced energy because those workers are no longer in the centralized location or how their reduced carbon emissions contribute to the organization's uh, smaller carbon footprint. footprint. Beg your pardon. And think about how just having those employees not in the workplace reduces the office waste. Uh, in my research, I examined scholarship around the remote work performance uh, of different successful teams and learned that quality, availability, and productivity were consistently higher among at-home workers when compared to their counterparts in traditional uh, centralized locations. Dr. Edith Witter considers exploration as the engine that drives innovation, and I couldn't agree more. So I combined scholarly research, conversations across an expansive network of professionals, and interviews with some dear friends and colleagues to provide you with a little more insight into how successful remote or virtual teams are enabled. While my survey focused on frontline enablement, I also took a look at back office applications that might support utility functions such as the billing inquiry that occurs with medical, financial, and retail organizations, as well as the security of PII and PCI required for all of these, and the regulatory constraints of financial instruments and insurance coverages and claims. From the survey, five common themes emerged that provide insight for enabling remote workers. For the systems, there were 20 important points of discussion on business systems. For employee qualifiers, there were 11 viable points for establishing qualifications and selection of remote workers. There were six essential factors that arose for preparation and environmental considerations, and seven important points to consider when managing the performance of a remote front line. As with any survey, there are a few highlights worth noting as consistent across all sources. And that was the fact that they all use some type of VoIP or SIP system to support remote work. They all incorporated daily database monitoring protocols for the work systems that were employed, and they all required a compliant certification that could be verified by internal and or external audit sources. And they were insistent that the employees commit to using a dedicated workspace free from unprofessional background noises and disruptions. 
Expanding on the considerations to enable a remote frontline workforce, I want to reiterate the unique nature of utility work, both in office and in the field, was considered throughout the review, which is why this is by no means meant to be an exhaustive analysis. Rather, the hope is that this can be a springboard for dialogue specific to where you are in the process and where you would like to be when normal is redefined for your organization. Enabling remote work business systems. A common expectation when enabling remote workers is the expectation that the organization will provide the essential technology to perform the work required, protect the data transmitted, and support a consistent and reliable level of service to the customers. But what about the systems that they run on? What you see here are the factors that came up for consideration for secure systems, access protocols, the minimum requirements for the at-home workspace, the performance tools to maintain production, and finally, the technology for enabling connections that are vital to virtual teams. All of this should be represented in a plan for enabling a remote workforce. Regardless of where you are in the process, consider this a good place to shore up the protocols around how work is being technically enabled at present and for the future. Remote work qualifiers. Uh, this is an important topic right now because the landscape for remote work opportunities has changed in light of social distancing restrictions and organizational citizenship values. While some utilities have instituted remote work to thin the herd coming into the office, not all workers have been afforded this opportunity because of the hurdles involved in labor negotiations and some of the preconceptions concerning security and technical functionalities. I'd like you to take a look at what successful remote teams consider when qualifying remote workers. First, they are all consistent in their efforts to clearly define and develop risk mitigation strategies when selecting the work that is suitable and when mandating compliance certification as a prerequisite to remote work. Another theme that was consistent in my research was the flexible nature of frontline remote workforces. Some have existed in the utility sector as an emergency protocol for inclement weather or storm events. But looking forward, there may be support for keeping teams in practice through remote work on a rotating schedule. Processes such as water quality testing or device testing or transformer repairs, for example, can't be performed from home. However, dispatching workers from at-home locations minimizes contacts, minimizes emissions, and can increase process efficiencies. Preparing the remote worker. Once the systems are in place and the team members are selected, no matter what stage you are in with using remote workers for frontline, back office, or field functions, supporting this workforce is just as important in the remote environment as it is in the traditional centralized setting. Many remote teams were launched at the onset of COVID-19, and we're now taking a moment to look at building support and documentation for how work should be performed, how employees should represent the organization, and how a person can prepare themselves for the opportunity to work remotely. These are some of the considerations that came up and the uh, factors that we really think are important in preparing the remote worker. It's not only the compliance certification and the confidentiality agreements, but there's an opportunity for hands-on software training that is specific and vital to supporting a virtual work environment. And of course, establishing what the minimum organizational tenure or job in uh, time and job tenure that's required before joining that remote workforce. And finally, an innovation that is certainly worth considering because it builds the connectedness among uh, virtual teams. And that is understanding the software through a trial basis simulating a home office workspace or workshop that helps individuals understand what work is going to be like separated from the standard office workplace. Enabling the at-home work environment. You know, a consistent practice across successful virtual teams is the documented mandatory requirements for the at-home workspace, particularly when dealing with frontline employees that are going to interact with the public from home. The details vary across industries and region in terms of the specific requirements for things like Wi-Fi continuity in rural areas or acceptable background noises such as livestock and trains. But they all lean heavily on the employee's responsibility to establish a space 
that is free from unprofessional or disruptive noises, and for those on camera, imagery. The consent to maintain the at-home workspace is an explicit agreement. And in some of my discussions, I've learned it's one that has to be vigorously enforced at times. Managing work performance for frontline workers uh, is perhaps the most adaptable function of the virtual team. The systems in place to support workflow, quality, and audit functions is commonplace within utility organizations. So what bears consideration for enabling performance management in virtual teams? Well, overwhelmingly, the key is clearly defined expectations and performance goals. Second to that would be the SOPs in place to support remote functions, and ideally that they are accessible from the virtual team. I wanted to share some expert advice on the subject of leading virtual teams. And uh, as my friend and fellow QATC board member points out, we're actually striving to lead high performing virtual teams. To do so, we need to remember that nothing replaces the power of personal connection when leading high performing remote teams. Your team wants to know you care about them as a person first. You must find ways to connect virtually and be intentional. Eric Sawyer is the AVP of AM Trust Financial Services. And before that, he was very successful leading as an executive of USAA's quality organization. As we focus on enabling the teams that we will need to continue for just a little while longer, how are you assessing your efforts thus far? How did the debrief go? Is the roadmap to normal complete? Before moving forward with the personnel adjustments required for the road ahead, now is the time to understand fully what challenges remain unresolved and what impacts will they have on our new normal. Then and only then can we forge ahead lest we fall short of our ambitions and our abilities. So I want us to look at our path to the new normal as a multi-dimensional roadmap. We will need to address at a minimum six key areas to ensure that we have comprehensive coverage of the employee, enterprise, and organizational needs. There is employee well-being, organizational realignment, safety and OSHA, budget, procedures, and technology, all intersecting at some point with the collective bargaining agreement or the CBA or CLA, the enterprise data systems or EDS, and the framework for managing organizational change, the big OCM. Employee support systems cannot be underestimated in the plans for what lie ahead. COVID-19 multiplies employee risk and warrants professionally designed interventions that address the psychological toll that working through a global pandemic has on every individual. That includes you. Now, I'm pretty predictable. I tend to lead off with employee well-being, recognizing that without a resilient workforce, yeah, you got no shot. So I want you to develop solid resilience plans for your team that help them to navigate adjustments in job function hierarchical structure, and make way for the potential for illness. Resilience plans connect in a tapestry, a responsive tapestry, uh, if you will, that supports employees and manners relative to where they will report in the event of contamination and the protocols they're with and what leadership structure will ensue if there isn't time to plan for unexpected losses. This is the reality of resilience planning. The unthinkable must be thought about for the organization and the wellness of every single employee. As you can see, I've done a considerable amount of research to provide you with a solid starting point for developing your roadmap and resilience strategies for how you will not only weather, but define what is the new normal for your organization. While utilities tend to divide and conquer, uh, with initiatives such as these, I'm recommending a, a different approach. Uh, we typically would assign to one group whatever is associated with them. For example, finance would get any of the budget items and come back with ideas for how we should move forward. I'm going to ask that you solicit input from across the organization's management team to gain a solid understanding of how COVID-19 measures might show up on the bottom line in the safety protocols in the procedures that change how we start and stop and add new services. Uh, an example of it is ask the question, did HR provide a new payroll code so that we could track the illnesses that are related to COVID-19 and perhaps participate in some reimbursements uh, from uh, government funds? Well, the question then is, how has that production loss increased operation costs in overtime? 
Have there been organizational changes in EHS to accommodate the company's new COVID Cesar? I'm only half joking. It is quite necessary for someone to coordinate all of these efforts and be sure that the organization has taken care of its employees and its customers. Planning through the pandemic will not end with the last call. The decisions you make concerning how remote work will be assigned and how it has been assigned and what will become of it will define your new normal. On the subject of difficult conversations, a word of advice, provide people with the information they need, not just what is easiest to share. People need to hear what you have to say, all of it. Eva Liggins is the Director of Operations for DC Office of Tax and Revenue. And prior to that, she set an innovation locomotive on the road to success with the city of Dallas's 311 Center nearly a decade ago. Now, as we talk about resilience plans and the strategies that we'll need to uh, come up with, with all of the changes that are right around the corner, I want us to make sure that we uh, are well prepared as we consider recalling our remote workers back into the workplace. We want to make sure that we inform our decisions with facts. Uh, the first place I, we would want to begin by identifying what are the real barriers to a long term frontline remote workforce? Uh, is it technical support? Are there regional challenges with wireless continuity? Is it the security of our systems? And is our workforce maybe too inexperienced for it? This is certainly not something to consider when we have a green workforce because of the amount of support they may need. Another thing is our performance. If we've already deployed a remote workforce and we're struggling with performance issues, then maybe that's one of the long term barriers uh, that we need to resolve before we can look at having uh, a remote work team. All of these facts will help to inform whether or not this is a strategy for our organization. This is not something where we look at ourselves against the backdrop of other industries, other sectors, or even other utilities. This is a decision that must be made based on your existing organization and the structure and culture that lies therein. It may seem natural to just bring people back in, but just as much as with any major change in your organization, this is a decision that with all the unpredictability of a global pandemic must be made with a strong business case. The next thing I want us to consider is that the foundations of solid change management and change resilience is communication. So we want to make sure that we keep our employees informed throughout this entire process. One of the key things we want to do is address for our employees the reasons for returning. This reinstills in them that there is a sense that the leadership has a reason for what they're doing, has a plan for what they're doing, and brings stability to the mind of the employees. There, if we're going to come back to a centralized workforce, there has to be solid strategy behind it and a confidence that our leadership can carry us through that transition as well. And remember, when we're recalling people into the workforce, we, even though we don't have language around a global pandemic, we probably have language in our collecting bargaining agreement or collective labor agreements around the intent for bringing people back based on an agreed upon protocol. For example, if somebody has been in a job for so many years, does that trump whether or not they've been with a company for so many years? Which one takes priority and who comes back first? So that language needs to be respected as we make these plans for recalling people back into the workplace as much as possible. We want to align with our CBA. And remember, recalling is not when, when somebody is being asked to come back into the workplace, it is not inherently an undesirable request, just as remote work was not inherently a desired request. So remember, wherever possible, we want to allow our employees to tell us which one is the preference so that they're making choices that are already acceptable in their in in their um, work life balance uh, paradigm. The Society of Human Resource Management has published a very interesting article that highlights the implications of asking an employee to switch from remote 
to central or central to work. And what it does is it highlights for us some things we probably hadn't thought about. HSA contributions, um, child care provisions, uh, vehicle transitions and transportation limitations, particularly in this current state. So we want to keep in mind that they, the decision uh, to recall a, a worker into the workplace is not inherently a benefit, just as a decision to send somebody to work from home is not necessarily a benefit. We don't want to make that assumption. Let's let them choose. So now, of course, we're thinking we've got to make this decision, but this is the time to ease into those decisions and not lean into those decisions. Remember all the work that goes into changing a bid um, and, and all the transition time that we give an employee when we're asking them to shift their day of week. Think about what that means when we're asking them to ship, shift their location of work and everything that goes with it. So this is a time for us to build transition plans for our employees. And we want to make sure that that schedule accommodates uh, the exceptions. It makes room for people to need a little more time or a little less time. We want to give that latitude as much as possible. So as we create these strategies, we build these um, structures, we want to make sure that we've given people time so that they can achieve the work-life balance that allows them to perform at their best. There's a safety matter in all of this. Of course, we're responding to a global pandemic, but we're a utility organization and we lead by safety. And in so doing, we give ourselves the latitude to be more creative than we probably have been in the past. This is the time to start talking about how can we uh, split our schedules? How can we share our work team space so that we can accommodate the distancing protocols without having to reconfigure our workplace? There's a new normal that we are going to have to accommodate in whatever plan we make, whether we're recalling our workers into a centralized workplace or whether we're allowing them to stay a longer term in their remote workspaces. The new normal is we have to be flexible. We're going to have to accommodate the safety measures that are necessary to not only serve our communities and serve them well, but to protect our most precious resource, and that is our employees. Of course, there are going to be some things we need to address that we cannot change. For example, in the utility space, there is a confined space protocol, and that's going to trump any social distancing. So what we want to do is make sure that we accomplish the needs of safely protecting our employees and serving our community by having a clear, a well-defined process for compliance on both fronts and giving them the right tools and protective equipment so that they can be successful in their job and remain safe. The rewards of returning back to the workplace as it was carries with it an inherent predictability. And there's a comfort in that, that things uh, psychologically, people will see them as we can get back to this pre-COVID uh, pre equilibrium. Unfortunately, this may not be realistic. And at the same time, I'm going to challenge you. Is that really what we want in exchange for all that we've sacrificed and all that we've accomplished? We've gone through significant change and we've weathered it pretty well. So with a transformational drive, the new normal can be exceptionally rewarding for employees and the organization. The interesting part of that is, as I considered what would it take if we wanted to stay long term and we wanted to look at ourselves in a new light, the deliberation is the same. We will go through the same steps and we will probably come out better off. And with that, I want to share this uh, little story. I found myself in the heart of Ohio not long ago, collaborating with a work team across multiple sites. I encountered this client who was well ahead of the technology enabled curve in terms of empowering and progressively innovating with a remote enabled workforce. While there are many utility providers that have incorporated this into a responsive protocol for extreme weather, this team demonstrated throughout our engagement that this was not the exception, but a way of life across the organization. There were meeting rooms that were fully equipped with audio video conferencing tools and team meetings were more succinct than I'd borne witness to in my entire uh, history of client engagements. engagements. And as each team member uh, demonstrated, they were very well versed in the conferencing tools and poised to participate from wherever they were located whenever they were needed. 
I noticed that they also had small stand-up think tank rooms, no bigger than a typical business office, equipped with conferencing set up and two to three workstations. It was a brilliant picture of how one can create a large team functionality with very little real estate. And the flexibility was phenomenal. Further, I was personally oriented to the data transmission protocols that were strictly adhered to by everyone that I encountered. They truly had embraced what it meant to be an innovative utility. And today they go a step further, having deployed more than 400 laptops to equip call center agents so that they could work safely at home while they serve their community's utility needs and protect their family's well-being. Denise Ralston is, by every stretch of the imagine, what I would call a virtuoso of virtual teams. They've created this atmosphere in her organization that requires thinking that is unencumbered by an, a, a corralling regime and mindset. She shares this advice to those that are looking forward to such an environment. Don't establish policies that are based on the theoretical few employees that may not do the right thing. That's really how bad policies are created. Normal has changed for good. How you decide to respond going forward will shape how your employees interpret their place of priority within your organizational goals. When we all rise from the dust of a global pandemic, will your employees feel supported, cared for, empowered, valued, and safe? And your customers, will they reflect on the year of COVID-19 as the year their utility organization demonstrated responsiveness, resilience, compassion, determination, and an overall commitment to excellence? I'm sure they will. Once again, I thank you for tuning in to our webinar series today. Uh, if you have any questions or would like help with any of this content, feel free to contact me or reach out to Maria DeCellis. In the pages that follow, you will find the references for any of the material uh, used to develop this webinar, as well as an overview of our organization. Again, we appreciate you tuning in to Utiligence uh, webinar series on the new normal of COVID-19.